the energies of life in the form of temperature, light, air, and food, and so on, are streaming through you all at this moment in the most magnificently harmonious way. And you are, all of you, far more beautiful than any candle flame. Just sitting in these chairs, just zzz, going. You know? Only we are so used to it. We say about that, so what? Show me something interesting. Show me something new. Because it's a characteristic of consciousness that it ignores stimuli that are constant. When anything is constant, it says, okay, that's safe. It's in the bag. Needn't pay attention to that anymore. And therefore, we eliminate systematically from our awareness all the gorgeous things that are going on all the time. And instead, only become focused on the things, the troublesome things that might happen to upset it. Which is all right, but we make too much of it. And become, we make so much of it that we identify our very selves, I, ego, with the radar, with the troubleshooter. And that's only a tiny fragment of one's total being. So that if you do become aware that you are not simply that scanning mechanism, but you are your complete organism, then very swiftly, in turn, as a consequence of that, you become aware that your organism is not the way you think about it when you look at it from the standpoint of conscious attention, from the standpoint of the ego. From the standpoint of the ego, your organism is uh, your kind of vehicle, your automobile in which you go around. But from a physical point of view, your organism is again like the candle flame or the whirlpool. It is something which is a continuous patterning or activity of the whole cosmos. The key idea here is pattern. Let's suppose uh, I'm going to borrow a metaphor from Buckminster Fuller. Suppose we have a rope. And one section of this rope is made of uh, manila hemp. The next section is cotton. The next section is silk. The next section is nylon, and so on. Now we tie a knot in this rope. Just an ordinary one-over knot. You find by putting your finger in the knot, you can move it all the way down the rope. Now, as this knot travels, it's first of all made of manila hemp, it's then made of cotton, it's then made of silk, it's then made of nylon, and so on. But the knot keeps going on. That's the integrity of pattern, the continuing pattern, which is what you are. Because you might, you know, for several years you might be a vegetarian, and you might be a meat eater, and uh, so on, and you know your constitution changes all the time, but people, your friends still recognize you, because you're still putting on the same show. It's the same pattern. That is, the recognizable individual. But we are trained in our language. The very structure of the language we talk deceives us into misunderstanding this. Because when we see a pattern, we ask, what's it made of? Like you see a table. Is it made of wood or is it made of aluminum? But then when you inquire into what is wood, and how does wood differ from aluminum, the only thing a scientist can tell you is the different patterns, that is to say, the different molecular structure of the two things. And a molecular structure is not a description of what something is made of, it is a description of what dance it is performing, what motions, what kind of a symphony this is. Because basically, all phenomena of life are musical. And uh, gold differs from lead in exactly the same way that a waltz differs from a mazurka. It's a different dance. And there isn't anything that's dancing. That is a deception we get into because we have two parts of speech in our grammar. We have nouns and verbs. And verbs are supposed to describe the activities of nouns. And this is simply a convention of speech. You could have a language with only verbs in it. 
You don't need any nouns. Or you could also have a language with the nouns only and no verbs. And uh, it would perfectly adequately describe what's going on in the world. So if you were used to speaking with a, part, with a language that had one part of speech, you could say just as much as we can with two and be a lot clearer. Only at first it would sound awkward, but you'd soon get used to it. And then when you got used to it, it would be a matter of common sense that the patterning of the world is not some kind of stuff that's patterning. You don't have to seek for a substance underlying the whole thing. It's just patterning. And we're all that. And so in this way, there is, to a person who really wakes up, you very soon realize that your existence is not something that is just the uh, hopeless little creature that's suddenly confronted with a great big external world that goes at him and eats him up. Every tiniest little thing that comes into being, every minute little fruit fly or gnat or bacterium, I will go so far as to say is an event upon which this whole cosmos depends. This thing goes both ways. It's not only that every little organism which exists depends on its total environment, the reverse is also true, that the total environment depends on each and every one of those little organisms. So that you could say, this universe consists of a, an arrangement of pattern in which every event is essential to the whole thing. Now, we screen that idea out of our consciousness in exactly the same way that we screen out the perception of space as an important reality. Just as we pay attention to the figure and ignore the background, so we see one way of looking at things, mainly that the organism is very frail against the environment. It lasts a long time, the environment, but the organism only lasts a short time. What do you mean the environment lasts a long time? What does the environment consist of? Just a lot of little things. And yet there is the environment just as the same way as there is the face in the newspaper photograph behind all those little dots. When you get far enough away from it, you see the face. When you get far enough away from all the organisms and the little bits of things, you see the environment in another scale of magnification. But actually, uh, the whole thing is arranged in a, a polar system where the enormous depends on the tiny and the tiny depends on the enormous. And you get a relationship between these extremes, which can be called a transaction. That is to say, a transaction, when there's buying and selling, it's impossible to have buying without selling and selling without buying. So you, you always, wherever you are looking at the general panorama of sensory experience, try switching. Try shifting your attention to all the things you thought were unimportant to the constants, to the background. And begin looking at the spaces between people. Uh, all painters have to learn this. Because especially if you're working in oils, you actually have to paint in the background. Weavers know this. Because when they're making patterns in weaving, they've got to weave the background as well. Or if you do needlepoint with embroidery, think of the hours you spend putting in the background over the canvas in wool. You become aware of it. Same way the people who made the, the great oriental carpets. They're much more aware of the background as constituting an essential part of the total experience. So as you become aware of this, you will see the same thing that you notice in music. Namely that it is only as a result of hearing the interval between tones that you hear any melody. If you don't hear the interval, you're tone deaf, and all notes are the same noise. All you hear is rhythm. You don't hear any melody. You've got to hear the interval. So then watch the intervals between people. The things that aren't said.
the things that are tacit, the things that are implicit rather than explicit in all life. And then you begin to get connected. You now it's very important to have a connection in life. And um, to be in the know. And uh, this is the way it, it, it fundamentally comes out. Of seeing the thing you forgot. You know, you can always bug people in a beautiful way, in a very helpful way. By just saying to them, what did you forget? Well, I don't know. Uh, what was I supposed to remember? Oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not trying to put you on. I, I mean, it's not difficult. This is something completely obvious that you forgot. You, you'd easily remember it because it's so obvious. Well, that's the hardest thing in the world to think of. What's the most obvious thing I forgot? Oh, what's that? Well, who do you think you are? Well, how do you answer that question? Who are you? Well, you give a name. You say, I'm Joe Dokes, I'm Alan Watts. That's not true. That's what people told you you were. They put that name on you and they taught you to identify with it and to behave as it was expected to behave. But that's not who you are. You know very well. Go back in your memory. Go back into your infancy before they started telling you all this stuff. Who are you? And if you get with that, you know uh, very well who you are. Jolly old ancient of days. Only there's a conspiracy that you mustn't let on about that. Because everybody is. And uh, if one person realizes it, the other's a little bit offended. And they say, well, uh, how come you're so great? We worked it in Christianity by a very clever thing of allowing just one individual to be recognized as the God incarnate. And uh, nobody else, therefore, could be. And since he had been safely crucified and whisked up to heaven, he wouldn't bother us anymore. So everybody, therefore, who gets an intimation of who they really are, and ever comes out with it in Christian civilization, people say, who the hell do you think you are? Are you Jesus Christ? Or you can say, Jesus Christ said he was Jesus Christ, and everybody put him down for it, and that's what you're doing to me. Oh, they say, forget that one. Because uh, it's like uh, somebody comes out and composes some perfectly terrible music. The critics say, this man is a cacophonist. He is completely incompetent. And he said, did you re read the reviews of Beethoven's First symphony when it was performed at Vienna. Now the thing is, <laughs> we allowed one person, you see, one human individual, to be the incarnate God. Because we have all been living in a theory of the universe in which the individual is simply involved in something that happens to him. And we feel that this thing that happens to us is reality. It is facts that we have to face and accept and cope with. See? It's always something other than you. You don't recognize it as an integral part of your own being without which you cannot know what you mean by the word I. But in the truth of the matter is, though, that if uh, you will face it out, every single one of us knows that that isn't true. There is a, an, as it were, a recess of the soul, of the psyche, where everybody knows perfectly well that you are not just this irresponsible little mouse that's been chucked down into this world, but that you are really doing this work, you're running it. 
Only you can't admit it just in the same way as you can't admit that you're responsible for the way your own heart beats. You say, oh, that's not my doing. I have no control over my heart. Do you have any control over being conscious? Do you know how you will? Do you say, I intend to take my hand down from my face and put it on my leg? I can do that, but I don't know how the hell it's done. So that what we mean by the capacity of voluntary control in the ordinary sense of the word is this. We don't understand it at all. So you might say, in, in a funny backwards way, that the only kind of control you really understand is that way you're not using your will. Because you just do it so easy, like you open and close your hand. You know how to do it? Sure you know how to do it. But you can't put it into words and explain to someone how to do it. You say, well, come on, aren't you human? Don't you know how to open and close your hands? Do it, silly. But we don't realize, you see, that just as we know how to do this, we know equally well how to turn the sun into light, how to blow the sky, how to blow the wind, how to wave the, the ocean, how to um, digest food, and um, I might add, to be digested by bacteria and transformed. As we transform our stakes, uh, we will in turn be transformed. But the um, pattern keeps going. And it's always you. Only you see you have this marvelous capacity to transform yourself without knowing that you're doing it. Therefore, you keep surprising yourself. And therefore, you keep on doing it. Because if you didn't surprise yourself, you wouldn't, go, you wouldn't go on doing it. It's just the very fact, you see, that you seem to be the victims of a thing you don't understand, and that you seem to conclude your life every time in a wipeout called death, where all your control goes. It's just exactly that opposite condition to what you call being alive that allows you to be alive. Only every time it happens, it's like it's new. It's like every time you're born, it seems like it was the only time. But of course, if it wasn't like that, you wouldn't do it. When Hindus and Buddhists use the word karma, the basic meaning of it is action. From the Sanskrit root, kri, to do. And therefore, there is some error in the common translation of karma as a law of cause and effect or of cosmic retribution. As a man sows, so also shall he reap. Uh, it has a Western flavor, which is a little causal. The way the Buddha put it was slightly different. This arises, that becomes... Because between this and that, there is a polar relationship. And the full explanation of karma in Buddhist philosophy is called pratitya samutpada, which means the interdependent origination of all the forms and phases of life. Pratitya samutpada. And there are 12 links, shall we say, in the chain of interdependent origination, constituting a circle. And the existence of the circle depends on the presence of every one of the links. From one point of view in Buddhism, the chain of interdependent origination is looked upon as a chain, that is to say, as a form of bondage. The constituents, as it were, of the vicious circle in which most people and beings are living, which they call samsara, S-A-M-S-A-R-A, -S -A -A, samsara, the round of birth and death, the pava chakra, the wheel of pava which is becoming. 
And uh, so going round and round and round in the endless game of hide and seek is from one point of view bondage. Bondage to karma. And if you study the Bhagavad Gita, which is not a Buddhist book but a Hindu scripture, Krishna, the spokesman of the Gita, explains that the wise man is one who does what is called nishkama karma, nishkama, N-I-S-H-K-A-M-A, meaning um, passionless activity, in the sense that he acts without seeking a result, without being motivated by the fruits of action, and therefore is not bound by his own actions. You can be bound to samsara, the wheel of birth and death, by iron chains or gold chains. The chains are, I mean, I'm talking in a, more or less the language of popular Hinduism, that if you do bad deeds in this life, you will get bad result next time. If you do good deeds in this life, you may be reborn as an angel or uh, as a monk, uh, in which you'll get a better chance of liberation, but still... So long as you're looking for results, be they good or evil, you're still bound. Now, the way in which one becomes, as it were, free of karma involves another Buddhist point of view, which is a kind of a different way of looking at the chain of interdependent origination. It's the way which the Japanese call Jiji Muge. That is to say, the mutual interpenetration of all things and events. So that you could say that actually, in fact, deep, the deepest level of reality, this entire cosmos is a completely harmonious and blissful manifestation of uh, everything in a state of total enlightenment and mutual compassion. And therefore the task of the Buddhist or the Hindu discipline of meditation, the sadhana, the way of spiritual development, is to realize that for everybody, to realize it effectively in his own life. And therefore cease from the illusion that the universe is a fragmented uh, process of conflict. But first of all, we have to be clear about karma, that it is not to be understood in the Western sense of a law of cause and effect, or of a sort of retribution system, or a law. The word law is most unsuitable for concepts in Eastern Indian and Chinese philosophy. The word dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, -A, sometimes meaning the Buddhist doctrine, or a certain way of life when you talk about a person's dharma you mean their own function. We would translate svadharma as vocation. Sva is the same as the Latin suus, one's own. Dharma, function in this case, operation, way of life, style of life, profession, trade, role, means all those things. And the one thing that dharma really never means is law, although it's often translated that way. Because, you see, you don't get the idea of law until you move to a culture where order is based on the idea of obedience. In, in the West, you see, uh, the origins of law spring from where? The laws of the Medes and the Persians, the laws of Hammurabi, the laws of Moses, and later Roman law. The only healthy legal tradition we have in the West is British common law, which proceeds in an entirely different way from code law. Because you see, the difference between code law and common law is that code law is laid down by the wisdom of an all-powerful ruler who tells everybody how they must behave and they must obey him. But common law is evolved by discussion of particular cases, 
rather than referring all the time to abstract principles which are put down in words. And the judge, the good judge, is a wise man, a man with a sense of equity and fair play, who arbitrates an issue which is debated in front of him. And from the precedent which he creates by his decision, common law evolves. You see, that's a more organic way of producing law. The code law system, which we inherit from our most ancient theological backgrounds, is a tyrannical method of law by imposition. And so you must understand that in both Hinduism and Buddhism, there is really no fundamental idea of obedience to a personal ruler. Certainly not in Buddhism. A little bit sometimes in Hinduism. But even then we get terribly mixed up because, for example, I was talking of the Bhagavad Gita. This is often translated, the Lord's Song. Now for Bhagavan, or Bhagavad in Sanskrit, Lord uh, is an English equivalent, is quite inappropriate. Because a Lord is one who lords it over you. Bhagavan is a title of reverence and respect and love. Uh, the, the Song of the Beloved would be much better in a way, although it's not quite correct from a strict point of view, we don't really have an equivalent for this word, the Bhagavan. So, the, the, although you see there have, has been in India itself uh, tyrannical rule, and although the Arthur Shastra, as a manual of politics, it gives directions to a tyrant as to how to govern by absolute power, going along with this exposition of this very Machiavellian point of view to government, is the constant advice of the sage. Yes, this is what you have to do in order to fulfill your office as a ruler, but never forget that you'll never succeed. The more you try to rule things by force, the more you will stir up violence against you. And so you can never hold on to your power and your possessions. It will always flow away from you. So there was one of those great rajas of ancient India who asked a jeweler to make him a ring that would restrain him in prosperity and support him in adversity. And the jeweler wrote on the ring, it will pass. <laughs> but when we come to the deep cosmological and metaphysical ideas, we don't have law in the Western sense, and therefore nature is not looked upon as something which is an orderly system because it is obeying a commandment. In the West, we inherit the idea of law from those ancient conceptions of God, and it is even passed down into science, where we discuss laws of nature. But one recognizes more and more in the sciences that what we call laws of nature are simply observed regularities in the way things behave. And you, in order to observe regularities, you must look at things through something regular. That is to say, you must lay a ruler alongside them or compare their behavior with the regular behavior of a clock. But clocks and rulers are human inventions. They are regular measures which we use for comparing the rates of change. Say a clock is a measure of a rate of change. It's quite arbitrary. But we very easily compare our regulation measuring devices with what makes things happen. As if the sun rises because it's six in the morning. Now that's being completely backwards in one's thinking. And we get into the same confusion when we imagine, for example, that money is wealth. Here we have fantastic wealth, you know, and uh, we have the technological possibility of making everybody on earth the joyer of an independent income. We can't do it because people say, where's the money going to come? Because they think money makes prosperity. It's the other way around. It's, it's, it's physical pro uh, prosperity, which has money as a way of measuring it. But people think money has to come from somewhere, like uh, hydroelectric power or lumber or iron, and it doesn't. Money is something we invent, like inches. 
So you remember the Great Depression? When uh, there was a slump? And what did we have a slump of? Money. There was no less wealth, no less energy, no less raw materials than there were before. But it's like you came to build, work on building a house one day. And they said, sorry, you can't build this house today. No inches. What do you mean no inches? Ah, just inches. We don't mean that we got inches of lumber. Yes, we've got um, inches of metal. We've even got tape measures. But there's a slump in inches as such, see? And people are that crazy. But they, they can have a depression uh, because they've got no inches to go around or, or, or no dollars. <laughs> That's all a lot of nonsense. <laughs> but you see, because we get thinking backwards, uh, making the uh, metaphysical tail wag the dog, making uh, the law rule things, whereas it doesn't. It's merely a way of measuring what happens. And so, you, you see, when you get into Buddhistic thought, you don't get that confusion. You're the, way, the, you're the other way around. So you're looking at a system uh, where, to go back to the Buddha's words, this arises, that becomes, which is a way of saying, you can't have this without that. You can't have here without there. You wouldn't know where here was unless you knew where there was. And they come into being together. You don't get first here and then there, or first there and then here. These arise interdependently. That's the meaning of interdependent origination. And to grasp the idea of interdependent origination is as important as the idea about seeing uh, how things are related by space and intervals. And seeing, therefore, that uh, you, you tend to look at life from a myopic point of view and see details, see the trees and not the forest, see yourself as something uh, loosely related to everything else that's going on and not integral to it. You see the, the, the figure but ignore the background. But the figure and the background arise mutually. They are to each other as this is to that. And so we really have to rid our brains of the notion of causality. The notion of causality being that present sets of circumstances are the result of past sets of circumstances. And that therefore certain events which are called causes are responsible for following events called effects. And all this is an enormous piece of mumbo-jumbo. Because what is not seen and what is not clear in thinking that way is that in physical nature there are no separate events. This is startling to people. But it's really quite easy to see that there are no events in nature. Because you can ask very simply, let's take something called an event. How do we demark it from other events? At what point, shall we say, uh, were you born? Were you born at parturition? Or when the doctor slapped you on the bottom? Or cut the umbilical cord? Or when you were conceived? Or when your father and mother were first attracted to each other? When was it? When did you begin? There's no way of deciding except arbitrarily. And for legal purposes, we say you were born at parturition. And that's when the astrologer casts your horoscope, except that other astrologers disagree and want the conception time. Say so that's the real beginning. There isn't a real beginning. It goes back and back and back in an inseparable continuity. When are you dead? That's another big argument. And you can, all, you can get all kinds of ideas about that. So what once you see that an event is a, a term in an intellectual calculus. Calculus being the way of measuring, say, curved formations by reducing them to point instants and counting it, see? But actually, the point instants are imaginary. The curve wiggles along, and it doesn't uh, stutter from point to point. 
but in calculus you make it do that. So just as uh, there are no point instants in the curve, so there are no events in nature. Nature is a constantly fluctuating pattern. You can uh, only designate particular wiggles in a pattern arbitrarily. You can count a convex formation as one wiggle or a concave formation as one wiggle. Then you decide if you call it one way, well, if you give the convex properties the title of wiggle, you have to deny it to the concave properties and vice versa. So when you see that what we call separate events don't exist, it becomes nonsense to speak of one event causing another. What you really mean is that the two events which you speak of as being causally related are simply two parts of the same event. They go with each other in the same way as this with that. The relationship is not causal. It is mutual. And it works two ways in time because future, so-called future events are not merely passive to past events. But you could easily see when, for example, any biological process goes on. You can reason just as well from the future to the past as from the past to the future. Why do two mammals have sexual intercourse? Well, it isn't just that they enjoy it. It's also that they're a very complex system which does this because it makes babies. And the prospect of baby works in reverse and creates desire. You can reason that way. Or it's silly, <laughs> because <laughs> the whole process is one. And when we speak humanly and purposively, I am going downtown to buy groceries. Then a future event could be said to be the cause of why you're now starting out to get into the car, buying groceries. And the, the difficulty we have in seeing this to be so is that we think in an either-or way, which is uh, what is called dualism in Hindu-Buddhist thought, and that liberation is being free from dualism. So when you think in an either-or way, you see the figures in the background as moving, and therefore being responsible for their action. But if somebody argues the other way around, say the figures, are just following lines of force in a field. Gravitational principles say we're all human beings, you see. We're all concentrated on our fact that we're individually rushing around and doing this and that. But we don't see that we're equally sucked and that we move around in response to all sorts of stimuli. But neither position is adequate. You have to see that our being sucked by all sorts of stimuli is exactly the same thing as our apparently voluntary and deliberate action. Because what we're looking at is not this Newtonian game of billiards where balls roll because they are hit by cues. What we're involved in is a dance where, for example, watch a snake. When a snake swims, there's nothing more beautiful than watching a snake swim in water. Lovely motion. But you see, it wiggles along, and its wiggle is conceivable, you see, as convex, or was it concave? This way, and that way, and this way, and that way. Now, which side of the snake moves first when it wiggles? So it's very easy to see there. Now, when we act, interact with the world, what moves first? Who starts it? The objective world or the subjective world? They are related as this to that. You can't have an object without a subject or a subject without an object. You can't have something known without the knower. 
And that gives the show away. There isn't any real distinction between the knower and the known. There's two ways of looking at something, yes. Two poles of a single process. But the knower and the known are subsumed as the knowing. And all life is knowing. Being, becoming. 